today we're going to start on the proof of the main theorem. So uh, this is going to take today and next lecture to prove completely. So this is what Mazur proves in his paper. Uh, and the statement is, uh, so n is a prime greater than 7 and not equal to 13. Then no elliptic curve over Q has an end torsion point. The statement's also true for 13, but it's going to be a different argument. And so recall uh, that it's enough to find a quotient. A of the Jacobian that satisfies two conditions, so such that A is rank A of Q is rank zero, and uh, this um, and the two cusps are not equal in A. Furthermore, this rank zero condition is implied by another condition. So if the P torsion of A, if its Jordan holder constituents are just trivial and cyclotomic, then you automatically have rank zero. So for the rest of today and tomorrow, n is going to be a prime like this. And does anyone know why we have to exclude 13? We're going to prove it by using this criterion. reason is that the genus of x0, 13 is 0. So the Jacobian is 0 in that case, and so we can't find a quotient that separates 0 and 13. So uh, we actually, if you remember, we proved a formula for the genus of x0, n. If n is prime. And it was roughly n over 12. So it was uh, the floor of n over 12, and then adjusted by 1 if n is minus 1 mod 12, and adjusted by minus 1 if n is 1 mod 12. So for 11, you get 1, and for 13, you get uh, 0. And you can see that as long as n is not one of these primes, then that genus is always positive. So in the cases that, that we care about, the Jacobian is always non trivial. Okay? Okay, so, <coughs> right, so I, I want to first uh, start thinking about the cusps, this condition that these two cusps are distinct in A, uh, and for that I just want to begin by analyzing the cusps in J0N. So uh, the difference of the two cusps is a point here, and what can we say about it? Okay, so the first statement is that this difference uh, is a non-trivial point, non-trivial torsion point of order dividing n minus 1. Uh, non-trivial torsion point on J0n. Okay? So the proof Okay, so the non-trivial part just sort of comes for free. So let me remind you what that is. So uh, the map, say, x0n to j0n, that takes a point x, the difference of the divisor x minus the divisor infinity, 
uh, is injective. And the reason, well, if, say, we had some point here that went to zero, other than infinity. So to say that this divisor goes to zero in J0n exactly means that it's the divisor of a function on X0n. Okay, so this function, in saying that its divisor is this, means it has exactly one zero and exactly one pole. So that means the map to P1 is a degree one map. So that means it's gene is zero. But as long as you're a positive genus curve, this map to the Jacobian is injective. And so this difference, 0 minus infinity, will not be 0. OK, so why is it torsion? Well, I mean, to show that it's torsion of order dividing n minus 1, I need to show that when I multiply this divisor by n minus 1, it's a principal divisor. So actually, I have to construct a function whose divisor is that. And so we're going to do that by using uh, some particular modular forms. So recall that we have this modular form delta. So this is defined as um, 4 times the Eisenstein series E4 cubed, maybe plus 27 E6 squared. I don't remember the constants, something like that. So this was the unique cusp form up to scaling. of weight 12 for gamma 1. And it has the property so it has the property that it doesn't vanish on the upper half plane. It's holomorphic and non-zero everywhere on the upper half plane. Uh, and there's two ways to see that. Um, so why? Well, okay, one reason is that we, we gave a modular interpretation for delta. It's the discriminant of the corresponding elliptic curve for an appropriately chosen model. And that's always not zero. So one reason is that delta z is the discriminant of the elliptic curve at z up to non-zero scalar. So therefore, non-zero. Another reason is that we had this product formula for delta. I didn't prove it. I just stated it. But it's also given by this product formula, and so that's evidently non-zero. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, it has the Q expansion at infinity begins with Q, and then there's higher order terms. Uh, and the reason for that, I mean, you can just calculate with the first few terms of the Q expansions for the Eisenstein series to see that that's the case. So this vanishes to order one at infinity. Okay, so whenever you have a modular form for gamma one, well, it's obviously a modular form for gamma zero n as well, because it's a subgroup. You can get another modular form for gamma zero n by putting an n in front of the z. We talked about this when we talked about new forms and old forms briefly. So delta of nz is a um, weight 12 modular form for gamma zero n. And of course, it also doesn't vanish from the upper half plane. So we can look at the quotient. We do delta of z divided by delta of nz. This is a gamma 0 n invariant function on the upper half plane. And so it therefore descends to a member of a function on x0 n. Which I'll call f. 
And because delta is nowhere vanishing, it doesn't, I mean, this function f has no zeros or poles on y zero n. In other words, the visor is just supported at the two cusps. Okay, so we can see what, I mean, using the Q expansion, we can see what the divisor looks like at infinity very easily. So delta of nz, remember Q is like e to the 2 pi iz. So when I do delta of nz, that's looking like making Q be Q to the n. So this begins Q to the n. So delta of z over delta of nz, begins with q to the minus n minus 1 plus i over terms. And this is the q expansion at infinity. And at infinity, q is a local parameter. I mean, it descends to a local parameter on x0n. So this says that uh, f has a pole of order n minus 1 at infinity. place f can have a pole or a zero is at zero, the other cusp. And since the degree of the divisor is zero, then it must have a zero of order n minus one at zero. So div f is n minus one times zero minus n minus one times infinity. And so that exactly means that zero minus infinity is killed by n minus one. All right, are there any questions? Okay, so the, we need to know one more thing about this point, this torsion point. We need to know how the heck algebra acts on it. So recall that we had, oh, I'm gonna make two remarks first. The first remark, uh, we didn't compute the exact order, we just showed that it was killed by n minus 1. Um, Og showed that the order of the sky is n minus 1 divided by the GCD of n minus 1 and 12. And the second remark is that uh, in his paper, Mazur shows that this point generates the entire torsion subgroup of J0n. The only torsion points are the obvious ones. Okay, so now we want to know how the heck the algebra acts on this point. So recall that if we have a prime L not equal to N, then we get a Hecke operator PL. And this acts on all sorts of different things. In particular, it acts on the Jacobian. So it makes sense to apply this operator to a point in the Jacobian, such as 0 minus infinity. And the result is that if you do TL of this point, and multiplies it by L minus 1, L plus 1. OK, so this is just, I mean, kind of an easy exercise with the heck operators. Uh, I mean, you can use the definition over the complex numbers. So let me kind of sketch out goes. Uh, I don't think we talked about everything in complete detail here. So let f and g be the heck correspondence. Right, so these 
these two maps from X0NL down to X0N. And we talked about these moduli theoretically. One took an elliptic curve, you know, an E in a subgroup to just the elliptic curve, and the other one quotient by the subgroup. Uh, so this space, X0NL, has four cusps. And in fact, the set of cusps on it is the product of the cusps on X0N and X0L. So I'm going to denote the cusps by coordinates, x, y. So I'm going to think of cusps on x0, nl as x, y. So this is a cusp on x0, n, and this guy has a cusp on x0, l. And x and y, since they're just cusps on these two things, I can think of them as being elements of 0 and infinity. And so explicitly, I mean, how this works, the, the, set, of, I mean, the set of cusps on this thing is the quotient by gamma 0 nl of the rational projective line, right? Because that was what, how we compactified the upper half plane. We added these p1, q points. And, and the way that this description works is, uh, I mean, the only thing that matters for detecting orbits is whether you have n's and l's in the denominator, right? So there's four possibilities. You have none in the denominator, or n, or l, or both. And that's how you get the cusps. Okay, so the, the map F, one of these maps in the Hecke correspondence, is just induced by the identity map on the upper half plane. So in other words, I mean, you take the identity map, and here you quotient by gamma 0 nl, here you quotient by gamma 0 n, so you get a map, and that's what the map F is. Uh, and so in particular, F's the identity on, I mean, it extends the identity on h star, so it x by the identity on p1q, and so it just takes, so f of xy is just equal to x. And uh, g, the other map, is induced by multiplication by l on the upper half plane. And so it's just given by multiplication by L on P1, Q, and that's not going to change if you have an N in the, denom in the denominator or not. So it also is the case that G of X, Y is equal to X. And then we need to know the ramification of F. So uh, the, the ramification index of F uh, at a point of the form star comma zero is L, and at infinity it's one. And you can check this ramification just by computing the indices of the stabilizers of the cusps in the gamma zero and gamma zero. We did something like this before, I'm not gonna do this now. Okay, but anyway, this is enough to compute what we need to compute. So if we do F star, so if x is a cusp on x0, n, so 0 or infinity, when we do f star of this divisor, right, the way that we compute that is you sum over the pre-images of x, and so there's two of them, there's x comma 0 and x comma infinity, and you weight by the ramification index so that things work out correctly. So you're going to weight by L over 0. So it's L times x0, and then you weight by 1 here. And now if I apply g lower star to this, all I do is just evaluate these g at these points. And so that just removes, I mean, takes x0 to x and x infinity to x. So g lower star of this f upper star, I'm just going to get l times x plus x. So it's l plus 1x. And so when I do g lower star f upper star of 0 minus infinity, it just multiplies by l plus 1. Okay.
Okay, so that's what we need to know about the cusps. Now we're going to move on and try and find this quotient of the Jacobian. So I'm going to, for the, it's going to be convenient to introduce a little terminology. So I'm going to say that an abelian variety, A over Q, satisfies the condition JH of P if the Jordan Holder constituents, and it's this thing that we always talked about, Jordan Holder constituents of AP. Q bar are trivial and cyclic. So it, this is equivalent to saying that so it's equivalent to taking the rational p tate module of A and saying that it's semi -simplification, the semi-simplified reduction of it, mod p, is just trivial characters and cyclotomic characters. So vp of a is the rational tape module, tp of a is the integral tape module. Semi-simplified reduction of this is just sum of trivials. Uh, so let me remind you, if you have a, well, one sec, if you have a, uh, a representation of a group on a QP vector space, uh, let's say like a compact group, you can pick a stable lattice, so a ZP lattice that it preserves, and then you can quotient that lattice by P and get a representation over FP of the group. And that's not well defined, because you can pick different lattices and you can get different reductions. You actually will get different reductions in general. Um, but it's always true that the semi-simplification of that reduction is well defined. So that's what I mean by the semi-simplified reduction. Do you have a question? Okay, so this JHP condition is you can read off from the rational tape module, and therefore it's an isogeny invariant. So it doesn't depend on the choice of the lattice if the representation is absolutely irreducible. Um, which, I mean, the ones that we're going to be dealing with never are because there's decompositions under the heck algebra that typically aren't. Um, but for a generic abelian variety, it probably is true that it's absolutely irreducible, and then it will be well-defined. Okay, so recall that we proved this uh, decomposition. Uh, up to isogeny at least. The Jacobian of n, uh, J0 of n, is the product of these Shimura construction of Ewing varieties. So here the product is over um, Galois orbits of, uh, of normalized eigenforms. F in S2 of n. Uh, it's the same to say you take the product over the maximal ideals of the rational Heck algebra. Yeah. Uh, up to an isogeny, we have this product. Okay, and so for a little while, most of the rest of the day, I'm going to make an assumption. So I want to assume that all these f's have their uh, HECA coefficients in Q. So that implies that when I say Galois orbits here, that implies that each one of these orbits is a singleton. And it implies that each one of these AF's is an elliptic curve. 
remember in general the dimension of AF is the degree of the coefficient field of the Q. So this assumption is going to make the proof a little easier. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that all the ideas are going to show up already. And so I think it's worthwhile to do the special case first. Uh, and then tomorrow, I'm going to deal with the general case. Or not tomorrow, but next lecture. OK, so we want, we're trying to find some quotient A of J0n. And to apply our criterion for rank zero, we want it to satisfy this condition, JHP. And that's a nice satisfying gradient condition, so there's a best choice, right? I mean, you just look at the factors that satisfy that, and you take the product of those. At least up to isogeny, that's what you should do. Right, so you should take A to be the product of the AS that satisfy JHP. At least up to isogeny. Right, because we only have two conditions that we have to satisfy. We have to satisfy JHP, and we have to make the cusps distinct. And so, in, to make the cusps distinct, you want to take as big a quotient as possible to make your life easiest. So, we should just take everything that works. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. But I want to define this a little more carefully because we want to know what A is exactly, not just what it is up to isogeny. So, uh, for an eigenform f, I'm going to let, so I want to call it p sub f. Maybe I'll use like a blackboard bold p. When I was writing this in LaTeX, I was using MathFrak. It's an ideal. Uh, so this guy is the ideal of the Heck algebra, uh, which is Right, this way. Pf is the kernel of the homomorphism from p to z, which takes tl to be tl eigenvalue of that. And so recall that uh, we'd seen this idea before. Uh, this variety af, by definition, is j0n mod pf j0n. That was what this Shimura construction was that we did before. Uh, I'm going to let S be the set of eigenforms F such that AF satisfies J0, JHP. And I'm going to define I to be the intersection of these ideals over this set S. And then A is going to be the quotient of J0n by this I. So it follows immediately that up to isogeny, this is what we want. And so that implies that A satisfies JHP, and that's enough to get that A has rank zero. That's what our criterion said. OK, so all we need to know is that the two cusps are separated in this quotient. So before I prove that, I want to think about one thing first. Why should, I mean, this condition that the Jordan Holder constituents or whatever is kind of restrictive. So why should there be any you know, AS that satisfy that at all? Why isn't this always zero? And we already actually know uh, that we can find things that work, and so I want to explain why we know that. It comes from the, the cusp stuff that we were doing, the difference of these two cusps. So suppose that let P be a prime dividing the order of this cusp difference. So then we know that 
J0n of Q has a P torsion point. Namely this point, or some multiple of it, rather. And so that implies that if you look at this P part of its Galois representation, it has to have a copy of the trivial representation. It has a Galois drain. And that copy must come from, I mean, one of these AFs. And so for such a thing, this is an elliptic curve, and I'm telling you that its p-torsion has a trivial Gal representation in it. We know that its determinant is the cyclotomic character by the Vey pairing, and so this, this F must actually satisfy JHP. So this implies that F is in our set S. Okay, so we can actually find a P for which this quotient we're making is non-trivial. Oh, and I guess I want to point out now that this P that we're picking is automatically going to be different from N. Right, because the order of this is n minus one, or divides n minus one. So keep that in mind. Uh, maybe I should write that. No, because we're not actually using the product. We're using this other thing. I think you'll see in a minute why. I, I mean, if it did, then you couldn't use the product. You'd be in trouble, I think, because P would kill this. In this point, you'd kill. Right, but this is our, our thing. So I'm just going to fix a P that satisfies this condition from now on. Okay, so to work with this A that we've defined, we've defined it as this J0N mod I J0N, uh, we need to kind of get at I in a better way. We need to understand it better than just how we've defined it. Uh, so I'm going to prove a few results on that first. So first, here's the characterization of this set S. So um, an eigenform is in S if and only if AL of F is equal to L plus 1 mod P. All right, so here's why. Okay, so suppose F is an S. So that means, by definition, that AFP uh, is just trivial plus cyclotomic up to semi simplification. I mean, what it means by definition is that it only has trivial and cyclotomics in it, but by the Vey pairing, if it has one, it has to have the other. So it has to be one of each. And so that implies that the trace of Frobenius on AFP is just the trace of Frobenius here plus the trace of Frobenius there, which is L plus one. But we know that this is equal to AL of F. That's what the Eichler-Shimura stuff gave us. And so this shows that this thing is equal to this mod P. Right, because all this is taking place in FP. And the converse is the same. I mean, okay, so conversely, if AL of F is equal to L plus 1 mod P for all L, then that says that, I mean, this equation still holds true. This one does. So you still get this equation. And so that says that the character of this AFP is the same as the character of trivial plus cyclotomic. And so they have to be equal to some simplification just by group theory. If this holds, then the character of AFP equals the character of trivial plus cyclotomic.
Okay, so I'm going to make a definition. So uh, the P Eisenstein idea. So this is in the title of Mazur's paper, modular curves in the Eisenstein ideal. So the P Eisenstein ideal is the ideal, I'm going to denote it A of the Heck algebra generated by P and TL minus L plus 1, for L, L not equal to N. Okay, so first thing I want to show is that the quotient of T by A is FP, so in particular, a is the maximum ideal. And the hard part of this statement, well, it's not hard given what we have, but I mean, the harder part is to know that this ideal is not trivial. Right? Why isn't it just the unit ideal? And it's not because we have a form in our set S. So here's how that works. So take F and S. Then if, um, okay, so by this, we know that AL of F is equal to L plus 1 mod P. So if I look at, so I have this heck algebra, and I have a homomorphism to T mod PF, and this thing is just Z. And this homomorphism takes TL to AL under this identification. And so it therefore takes... I mean, so if you look at TL minus L plus 1, it maps to AL of F minus L plus 1, and that's divisible by P. So all the generators of this ideal go to something in Z that's divisible by P, and P goes to something divisible by P. So the image of A under this map is contained in the ideal P. So in particular, the image of A in this quotient, this is all PF, is not the unit ideal. And so A is not the unit ideal. And so now it's just automatic that the quotient's FP, right? Because in this equation, I mean, in the quotient, the TL is equal to L plus 1. So every heck operator is equal to some integer. And we've killed the integer P. The FP. You have a question? Yeah. Well, I think that's just always the case because I mean we know that the I mean we showed that like the piatic representation, the trace of Herbenius was given by the AL. And so that determines the representation of the semi simplification because it's telling you what the character of the representation is. Sure, I mean, if, if AL of F were L squared plus 1, then you'd get sickle atomic squared plus trivial. Yeah. We, we are taking p to be a divisor yeah. of n minus 1. We didn't prove that you have to, but Mazur shows that that's the only one that works. Well, you can only take those. Any other questions? All right. Uh, another lemma. This will connect this Eisenstein ideal with some of the previous things that we're talking about. So F is in S if and only if the image of this ideal A in the quotient is not the unit ideal. And that's equivalent to A being A containing this ideal.
Okay. <clears throat> so the equivalence of the first two is basically this argument here. So the image of A in this quotient, which is Z, is the ideal generated by AL of F minus L plus 1 and P. And so for that, I mean, that's going to be not the unit ideal if and only if each one of these belongs to the ideal P. Let's go this this first two. Um, so if you have a containment, then of course the image of A is going to be non-trivial. And for the converse, if P is not contained in A, well. We know that A is a maximal ideal. So if you don't have a containment, then the sum is the unit ideal. And so that implies that the image of A in the quotient is the unit ideal. So now we can characterize this ideal I without talking about modular forms, which is convenient. So this ideal I is the intersection over the primes P of the Heck algebra that are contained in A and that are minimal. Okay, and the proof, so by definition, I is the intersection of the PFs over F and S. So it's a fact that the minimal primes of the Hecke algebra are just the PFs. As F varies over all the eigenforms. Um, is that clear? Does anyone have a question about that? Okay, good. Uh, it's easy. And we know that the PFs that are in S correspond to those which are contained in I. So. All right, so putting that together gives us Before we move on, let me give just one lemma. And that's that the localization of this ideal I at A is the unit ideal. Sorry, is zero. And the reason. So I is the intersection of the minimal primes of the Hecke algebra that are contained in A. So this localization, this IA, that's the so IA is the intersection of the minimal primes of the localized ring, TA. Right? Just how primes work in localization. And so that's the nil radical of TA, and TA is reduced. Right? We know the Heck algebra is reduced, so this localization is reduced. Okay, so we're going to prove what we've got in a minute with a little more discussion first. So suppose that X is a T module and every element is killed by power of P. So 
So what we have in mind is something like the Tate module of one of the Jacobians or Abelian varieties we're looking at. Okay, so in this situation, the action of T extends to an action of its piatic completion, which I'll note, denote as T hat sub T. This is by definition the inverse limit of T mod P to the NT. So this T hat P is a complete semi-local ring. And so that means that it's the product of its localization at its maximum yields. So in particular, this ideal A is one of the maximum ideals here. And so the completion of T at A is a direct factor. So since it's a direct factor, any module over this t hat p, such as x, you can break canonically into a t hat a piece and some other piece. So x is the sum of its localization at a, and some other piece, or x prime is killed by t hat a. And we can identify this x a, this localization, with the a power torsion in X. Okay, so here's what we wanted to get to. So the statement is that if you look at the Jacobian and you look at its A infinity torsion, this maps the A infinity torsion in A. And the statement is that this is a, an isomorphism. OK, so I'm going to let x be the P infinity torsion in J0n. I'm going to let y be the same thing in A. So we have a surjection from x to y. The subjection of the Boolean varieties induces one on the p divisible groups. And the kernel of this map uh, is, well, it's clearly the intersection of x with i times j0n, right? Because the kernel of the map to a is i times j0n. And this is actually equal to i times x. Uh, so let me briefly say why that's the case. So suppose that pick generators, say T1 up to Tn, of the ideal i. So then you can look at the map from J0n to the nth power to J0n, given by multiplication by these things. So x1 up to xn goes to the sum of Ti xi. And the image of this map is i times J0n. And since this is a map of abelian varieties, if you have a p power torsion point in the image, it lists to a p power torsion point here, which says that if you have a p power torsion point in here, I mean an element of here, you can list it back to a p power torsion point here, and that exactly means that its image is in Ix. So this gives us an exact sequence. Now we're going to localize this at A. So this localizing is exact. So we still have an exact sequence. And 
the localization of the kernel. Well, this is equal to the localization of i at a times the localization of x at a. And we know the localization of i at a is 0. So this implies that you get an isomorphism on the localizations like that. And I previously said that the localizations agreed with these, these things. And then this basically does it. So zero is not equal to infinity. Okay. So here's why. So let say p be the point zero minus infinity in J zero n. And let q be a multiple of it, which is p torsion. And not equal to zero. So uh, since we computed how the heck algebra acts on p, so tl of p is equal to l plus 1p, the same is true for q, because q is the multiple of p. And so that says that q is killed by the ideal a. So q is in j0 and a. And by this lemma, the a torsion here injects down here. So that says, so the previous lemma implies that the image of Q in A is not equal to zero, which exactly says that zero is not infinity. Okay, are there any questions? All right, so this proves the theorem and under this hypothesis that all the forms have rational coefficient fields. So before I move on, I want to draw a picture of the Heck algebra. I think this is useful for kind of organizing all this commutative algebra stuff, visualizing what's going on. OK, so uh, let me still work under this assumption that all the coefficient fields are Q. So T tensor Q. We know that that's just a product of Qs, one for each eigenform. Let's call the eigenforms F1, F2, up to Fn. T itself sits inside the product of Zs. And T is actually quite explicit. So T is the subring of Q to the n generated by the tuples that look like AL of F1, AL of F2, etc. So for each prime L, you just look at the coefficient of Q to the L in each one of these Fs, and you get some tuple of, of integers, and you take the subring generated by these tuples, and it gives you this heck algebra. So it's possible that T is actually a subring. It's not the full product. And the way that that can happen is if you have congruences between the Fs. So uh, if there exists congruences between Fi's, then T is a subring and not equal to Z to the N. And so I mean, you can see that, right? If, if F1 is congruent to F2 mod P, say, and that means that AL of F1 is congruent to AL of F2 mod P for every L. And so that means the first two slots are always going to be congruent mod P. So you're never going to get you know, one and two here. And so we can draw this picture of spec T, which is nice. Um, let me do it this way. So this line here is going to be spec Z. And then down below, I'm going to draw spec T. And so here is the generic point. That's the ideal 0 in Z. And that, I mean, over, over that, you get this. So you just get n points, one for each eigenform. And so let's say that n is 3, just for drawing this picture. So uh, 
Each one of these eigenforms gives you a homomorphism from T to Z, which is a section of spec Z mapping to spec T. So you get some kind of horizontal line going on. And so let me just draw three of them. So suppose that's F1, F2, and let's say that we have an F3 like this. These are meeting there, these are meeting there, these are meeting there, these are meeting there. So these intersection points uh, are correspond to these congruences. So maybe this is the prime two, this is the prime three, here's five, here's seven, and here's eleven. So this picture would be saying that, so this is F1, F2, F3. So this is saying that F1 and F2 are congruent mod two, F3 and F1 are congruent mod three. Etc. And now this P Eisenstein ideal is some point. I mean, it's a maximal ideal, so it corresponds to some point above P. And if you vary over all P, you'll get some collection of them. So there could be several of these P Eisenstein ideals. So you know, one could be here, say. Maybe one is here. Maybe there's just one at three and five in this case. So this pink guys, the specs of T mod A. And so in fact, there's another section in this picture that goes through these guys. And this is the, this corresponds to the Eisenstein series, E. So there's So there exists an Eisenstein series, so E, I'll call it, in M2 of the M0N. So not a cusp form, it's a weight to Eisenstein series. And it's Q expansion, the coefficient of L is L plus one. So these things, you know, the, the Eisenstein yield condition, that, you know, F is an F, S, if A L is congruent to L plus one, that means that you're congruent to E. And so these Eisenstein points are where this section of the Eisenstein series is meeting the sections of the cusp form. And this whole thing, so the spec of T is this thing, the whole thing is spec of, say, T star, where T star is the heck algebra inside here. So this is inside N of M2. And then this ideal, we define this ideal i, and so spec of t mod i. So remember, we defined, so to define i, we picked a prime p, and then we looked at the f's that, the f's whose corresponding p was contained in the Eisenstein ideal at p. So let's say that our p is 5, or 3, say. So here's our prime 3. This is the maximum ideal corresponding to the, I mean, the, the, the the point corresponding to the maximum ideal A. And then the P's that are contained in this point are the irreducible components that this point lives on. Right, so the spec of T mod A is just the union of the irreducible components that pass through this pink point here. So it's F1 and F3 in this case. Are there any questions about this picture? All right, so now I want to start talking about what happens in the general case where we have larger coefficient points. All right, so in general, uh, our well, p adic tape module, vp of j0n, decomposes a product of things that I'll call V sub F lambda, where the product is over pairs F lambda, where 
F here is a normalized eigenform. And lambda is a prime of the coefficient field of F. above P. And this VF lambda is a two-dimensional space over the localization of that field K at lambda. So the ideal situation is that we could take A to be the quotient of J0n such that the VP of A is the product of, of these guys that satisfy JHP, right? Whose semi-simplified reduction just has trivial and simple topic. So if we could do that, it'd be great, because then A itself would satisfy JHP. It'd be just like before. We'd have a quotient satisfying that condition, and we'd be done. But we can't do that. Not, not, in general, we can't do that. Uh, and that's because, well, I mean, it could be the case that J0n is a simple abelian variety. Right? I mean, it could be that you have lots of cusp forms, but that they're all Galois conjugate. And then the only thing that you could take for A is J0 in itself. It's, if it's simple, you can't make any quotient. And it could be the case that for some lambda, this thing does reduce to 1 plus cyclotomic, and for other lambdas, it doesn't. So I mean, then you're stuck, right? You just have to take the full thing, and it doesn't satisfy the condition. And so that's what happens. And so, I mean, the way that you can see that in this picture is that uh, if the coefficient fields aren't Q, then these sections will, I mean, will kind of split over some primes, right? So, I mean, imagine the coefficient field of F2 were larger. And generically, like, let's say it's a quadratic field. So generically, you have some quadratic field here. And then as you go over here, well, maybe 2 stays in that field. And so you just have 1 point over 2. And maybe the same is true for 3. But maybe at 5, it splits. And there's two ideals in your field over 5. So then it could be that you have a picture sort of like this. So like this, OK. Well, this, maybe, maybe we draw it in a different way. Right, so it could be that you split at 5. And one branch touches the Eisenstein section, and the other doesn't. Right? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And so in that case, I mean, these VF lambdas sort of correspond to the formal kind of branches of this thing. Right? So there's kind of two formal branches, but only one actual branch. And so you either have to take the whole branch and take the formal section, you know, one that you don't want, or take none of it. And like I'm saying, it could be simple. So you, you don't really have a choice. You have to take everything. It's just you're going to pick up these other pieces which you don't actually want. OK, but uh, maybe I'll say that while this is still up here. OK, so what that means is that the civilian variety A that we construct is not going to satisfy this condition, JHP. And we're not going to be able to apply theorem B directly. Just the hypotheses are not met. But what you can do is you can sort of localize the mordel Vey group over these kind of formal branches, the ones that you'd want. And then the argument of the theorem still applies in that case. So you can show that if you localize the mordel Vey group at these places, that it's still finite. And then it's just an elementary commutative algebra thing that that applies what you want, because it's sort of finite on each irreducible piece, and so that forces it to be finite. And the details of this are going to show up tomorrow, but that's the idea. OK? So in the time left today, I want to just get started on it.
All right, so I'm going to, as before, choose a p dividing the order of 0 minus infinity. And then I'm going to define the pi Eisenstein ideal just as before. And so once again, this quotient is just fp. This is a maximal ideal. All right, so as before, I mean, the only thing to prove is that the, I mean, it's not the unit ideal. It's basically the same idea. Uh, so oh, let me just go through it. So j0 and a p, again, contains a trivial representation. because we have a p torsion point given by 0 minus infinity. And so that must appear in one of these vf lambdas. But we showed that, I mean, this vf lambda is a two-dimensional representation, and we showed that its determinant is cyclotomic in, in general, even when you have higher coefficient field. So that means that uh, the semi-simplified reduction of the F lambda is just trivial plus cyclotomic. And so that means that our AL of F is equal to L plus 1 mod lambda. So AL of F is an integer in some you know, order in some field, and lambda is some prime there. And so this congruence is holding mod lambda. And so this shows that if I take the image of the ideal A in the quotient, so the image of A in T mod PF is contained in this prime lambda. And so that means it's not the unit ideal. Now we're going to define i just as before. So i is the intersection over those p that are contained in a, where p is a minimal prime, p. And our a is going to be just like before, j0n mod i j0n. And the same proof as before, and given what we have shows that the image 0 is not equal to infinity in this quotient. So that part of the reasoning didn't use anything about the coefficient fields. And so what remains, we just need the rank of a of q is 0. So I'm going to do that next time. So that, I mean, like I said, the idea is that we're basically going to mimic the proof of theorem B from before. And there's just going to be a, little, a few little wrinkles that we have to take care of along the way. All right, any questions? <laughs>